1. Background I used to work retail in a DVD CD store that rhymes with Manatee, Australia. We had computers that we could use to find certain titles and artists in the store if we had it in stock, or we could even order from any of the other 300 plus stores in the country and have it shipped to the store. Many people would use this for older CDs or collector's items that were harder to get. One day an older bloke came in asking about a certain smaller 80s rock band that I can't remember. I looked on the computer for him and was able to track down their album names, which of those he wanted, located the album in stores around the country and got his details to enter into the computer for when the albums arrived in the store so that we could contact him. He thanked me and said that he was so happy that we could get these albums in for him and left the store. The next day I got called into the boss's office because of a customer complaint. It was and is my only ever complaint in any job for the past nine years of working. He had rang up and complained that while my service was lovely, I didn't make enough eye contact when I was using the computer. Q malicious compliance. Three days later he came in because he had another band he wanted to order. Luckily I was working. As soon as he walked in I greeted him with the biggest smile and looked him straight in the eyes. When he asked if we had any of his band in stock, I typed it into the computer while maintaining direct eye contact. It took me four tries to find the right keyboard letters as I wasn't that great at touch typing. He was starting to get annoyed but he didn't voice it. Then I had to search what store location these albums were at. That took another couple of attempts to type. I turned the computer monitor around to the point it looked like it was going to snap off. I had to move displays from the counter, which took more time, but I was finally able to set it up at such an angle that I could read it off at a quick glance, but also still maintain eye contact. At this point he started to squirm and look away, but I was only beginning. Next was his details, and taking his deposit, normally $10. It took me a solid six attempts to enter his details into the system, as you had to select each box and type in, and that was hard considering I wasn't looking. At this point, he'd gone rather quiet and was looking at his shoes. When he handed me his money, I still maintained direct eye contact, and even dropped it accidentally out of my hand, which then led me to awkwardly slap around on the counter until my hand found it, wouldn't want to break that eye contact looking for a few coins. After all the typing attempts, it took me an extra ten minutes to serve him, all because I couldn't look at what I was doing. To this day, I've seen him a couple of times, but he won't come to my register, and he doesn't make eye contact or hides in the aisles until I'm busy with another customer. A shame, really. He had such lovely brown eyes. 2. For context, I have a few piercings, dyed hair, rainbow glasses, and a sticker-clad cane. People are going to stare anyway, may as well give them something to stare at. I'm also pretty casual. I afford expected respect to people, but especially since I work in fast food and only have a few co-workers. I and my other co-workers and managers don't see a reason to be excessively professional. I was hired with all these visible and have never been told to remove them, both GM and regional manager know. A new manager got hired. She met me about a week ago. Within three days of meeting me, she started commenting a lot on my behavior and appearance, to the point of demanding I fix my appearance immediately when I told her I didn't see how my appearance affected my ability to do my job. Now I have no problem removing the piercings or dyeing my hair a more natural color, but my glasses are pretty necessary for my current situation. I can sort of see about four or five feet away with them. Without them, I'm basically useless. And nothing can fix it at this point, so I've stopped bothering with an ophthalmologist. And I speak to my co-workers how they speak to me. We're all pretty casual and friendly. Also, the only thing she noted that was maybe against policy is the piercings. But we're technically allowed two stud piercings, and that's what I have. Either way, whatever, I was fine taking them out. But in a stroke of genius, I went, all right. I took out my piercings and tucked my hair into my hat. She decided to insist my glasses were just aesthetic, because of course real people who need glasses only wear plain black or metal frames. 
so I took them off, got sent back to work. At this point, everything is grey, so one of my co-workers led me back to my spot on the line. She then got on me about my performance dropping and accused me of doing it to spite her. I told her I couldn't see, and she started nagging me about how I needed to treat her with respect. She's not my friend. And once again commented on how casually I talk to people. So I drew inspiration from one of my favorite video game characters and started speaking like Fischl. Not well, but enough that it was obvious what I was doing. Alas, without my spectacles, tis but a blur. I also ignored her or pretended not to understand if she used any informal terms towards me. These shenanigans continued until another manager came in, saw me without my glasses, and got on the new manager, and told me to put everything back to normal. Apparently, I looked like a legal issue waiting to happen, without my glasses and piercings. I overheard things like, I just don't feel appreciated for the work I do here. And, Acer was being intentionally obstinate. I also overheard the older manager tell her that I am, in fact, legally blind, and had every right to pursue legal action for an ADA violation. I don't know the laws well enough to know if it was, nor would I have had the money to sue. But the idea someone would assume I could made me feel a bit satisfied. I ended up getting my ability to wear my piercings returned too, endorsed by the GM and everything. Not the thing I cared for, but a nice pro. I'm pretty sure I've angered the new manager though. Oh well. I don't talk to her, she doesn't talk to me, and that's fine. She's been the subject of criticism by my co-workers though, and I'm pretty sure if your entire store has seven active employees, you're not going to last long there when none of them like you. 3. My ex-employer announced some news regarding our jobs. It was obviously false. But instead of calling the bullshit, I treated it exactly as I would have if it was true. And it bounced back in their face. It was a while ago when I was working in a community-based organization. We provided end-of-the-line shelter for people and did rights advocacy in a medium town, 100,000. The salary was low, but okay. But most employees were there because they believed in what we did. The main problem was the manager. She didn't act according to the set of values the organization was based on. She was grossly overpaid compared to employees, took everything personal, made sure we were cut off from the administrators, and created an atmosphere where people feared retribution. We were unionized, but after a few months I realized no one was ever filing complaints, even for trivial matters, because they feared she was going to lash back at them. Turns out she had done it to a few people in the past. Once I figured I wasn't going to stay there much longer, I decided to sign all the complaints I could. According to Union, I could sign anything I witnessed, even if I wasn't the target, and figured I would see them to the end and leave. That way administrators couldn't claim not knowing, and there was a chance for my colleagues to have a better work environment. So of course, the next few months were a living hell. She picked on me regularly. Still, most people sided with me, at least privately, most of them fearing she would do the same treatment to them if they declared it publicly. One morning, she calls a staff meeting and explains that a large amount of complaints have been filed in the last months. She looks at me, and the cost to settle them or pay the lawyers to fight them might bankrupt the organization, and everyone is thus at risk losing their jobs soon. <laughs> Panic ensues. My colleagues are crying. They're calling their significant others. A lot of people are begging me to take them back, stating that she got the lesson. Some of them are genuinely pissed at me. In my opinion, it was obviously bullshit made to turn them against me. I mean, the sole emergency housing of a 100,000 city, annually filled at 115% capacity, would be closing for a dozen complaints where I'm not even asking for money in any form, over legal fees which were usually budgeted in advance. Come on, it's basic fear-brewing schemes. Normally, I would have questioned it during the meeting or try to reason with them afterwards. But at that time, I decided to comply with the narrative and treat it as true. I left for my break and did what I would have done if it were really closing, appealing to the public outrage to help us fulfilling our mission. I called the news, told them verbatim the morning announcement, the service hole it would create in the community, the job impact it would have in the city, etc. The local news picked it up. 
They called the manager and administrators about running the story, questioning how come there were enough complaints to threaten a 35-year-old pillar of the community services, asking what the complaints were about, etc. Before 4 p.m. that day, we had another meeting to explain that we must have misunderstood the first meeting, as the organization was in no way, shape, or form in danger of closing. Sure, we must have misunderstood. Moral of the story. Let those who brewed the piss drink it. 4. I lived in this town surrounded by magnificent vistas. There was a small development on the outskirts for upscale homes and mansions. Below the development were a few older homes. Many celebrities and business owners had vacation properties in this area. Multi-million dollar houses they used maybe one month out of the year. Real estate had always been at a premium. There was one older home amongst all these giant view lots. A new buyer was a guy who owned a slew of RV dealerships and had obscene amounts of money, so he bought the most prominent lot on the top of the hill as you entered the development of maybe 20 lots. His project was a massive stucco structure with a multi-car garage and a much bigger RV storage space with a huge roll-up garage door. Think of the biggest RVs you've seen, and he had a garage built for it with an automatic door. The house was a nondescript sand color with a red tiled roof, and the entire lot was tastefully landscaped with different kinds of rocks. Small mounds here and there, and a few shrubs to be low maintenance. The back of the property was fenced in with an eight foot or higher block wall. The fence itself probably cost 100,000. His neighbor was a school teacher who had lived there before the development started and had a modest house. He had decided to take advantage of the skyrocketing land prices in the neighborhood and sell, except no one wanted his shitty house when there were much larger empty lots available. He decided the real issue was the new behemoth blocked his view, and that's why no one wanted to buy his three-bedroom ranch house at mansion prices. It really was that his home didn't appeal to the market, so he became the president of the HOA which included the older homes and the new development. And then the harassment started. The HOA formed after the RV mansion construction began, but the home was so big it took almost a year to finish. The HOA had passed a design theme rule that all houses must be painted in a specific color palette, with the predominant color being taupe that was darker than this man's standard beige stucco color house. The palette included the taupe and selection of trim colors in pink, teal, or tan. It was intended to give the community a Santa Fe look, a feel which just happened to be the colors of the president's shitty house. The RV owner took the HOA to court, and the trial dragged on for a year. The guy never used the property, claiming it was still under construction during this time. He lost in court and had to repaint his property using the design theme-approved colors. So the guy brought out his contractor and had him repaint the entire property the Pepto-Bismol pink trim color. Everything was painted this color. The house, the fence, the trim, and the rocks in the yard. Then he had a massive driveway to the garage done in the same pink stamped concrete. Even the garage doors were pink. He locked up the house and never stayed there. The HOA was in an uproar because this house could be seen at the top of the hill for miles. None of the other lot owners broke ground. The president's home didn't sell for two years. 5. I recently left a job where I had a really toxic relationship with my boss. He was old school and prioritized work over everything else, expecting everyone to do the same. His expectations were so high it disrupted my work-life balance significantly. I have two young kids, and at this point in my life, I'm not doing late-night meetings or weekend reports. The company worked from home 50%, except my boss didn't believe in work from home. So we were 100% in the office, even when COVID was at its highest. And the city was flooded and the commute was dangerous. We were the only team of about 50 in the office. I told him that I was overwhelmed, that I had too much work to meet all deadlines, 
and he told me that I have to prioritize everything, because everything is urgent. When I asked what is most urgent, what should I do first, he told me everything. You get the idea of his approach. The company worked with flex time. As long as your hours equal 37.5 each week, 7.5 hours per day average, it's all good to work any time between 7am and 7pm. I could work a 10-hour day, then a 5-hour day, as long as it balanced out. My boss, however, demanded those hours be worked between 9am and 5pm. And if on any day I was to work 15 minutes over that 7.25 hours, then he wanted to be told what I was using the time for and to have his approval first. I used to start work at 7am, hit the gym in the morning around 9.30am for 45 minutes. When I joined his team, he didn't like this. He set up a meeting with me every morning at 9.30am, which he mostly didn't show up to. He certainly put an end to my morning sessions. I told him I found it detrimental to my mental health. He told me I needed to find another time. The reason I went in at this time is that I have two young kids and my wife works shifts. My boss, meanwhile, has fantastic work-life balance. Would often start at 9.30 or 10 a.m. and finish early, or randomly decide to work from home. He then asked that I send him multiple emails throughout the day every day, telling him what I'm working on and seeking his approval for stuff. Stuff that has never required approval previously. I obliged. I sent him five emails a day, every day, waffling on about what I was doing. I'd also ask questions in those emails, forcing him to read and respond to them all. After a while, I start to make the questions more subtle, not dot-pointing them, but sneaking them into the body of the text. I'd ask the same question multiple times, knowing by this point he's bored of reading my emails, and then when he didn't give me the answer, I'd let the repercussions happen. The repercussions that didn't exist until he demanded I seek approval. These repercussions were usually raised by my boss's boss. I knew they were happening, but I let it happen. I then responded to the group emails where my boss would blame me and include the emails I sent him seeking approval as he'd requested. This became a fairly frequent occurrence since I was sending 25 or more emails a day, which seriously was a huge chore on top of my high pressure, about 200 million of contracts annually roll. I had a really good reputation in the office for my work. Everyone seemed to respect me but him. His manner with people wasn't always appreciated. He was set arbitrary deadlines, and then half of them for seemingly no reason. When I refused to enact those, I often had to hand those deadlines on, citing anti-bullying policy. He'd tell me to just get it done. I understand I wasn't the most obedient employee, but he made me this way with his micromanagement. Eventually, I found a new role elsewhere. I demanded an exit interview where I explained how I don't believe he managed his team in accordance with the company's intentions, how I had expressed a concern for my mental health, and he offered no compromise, how he purposely booked meetings to disrupt my day, and how he demanded I email him over and over and ask for approval for 15 minutes of flexibility on start and finish times. The lady from HR had recently encountered my boss, and it wasn't pleasant. He was abusive to her, and she already had her crosshairs on him. I recently met up with a colleague from that team. A week after I left, my now ex-boss was demoted. No longer manages anybody, and has a much stricter schedule himself. Now that he reports to someone, my old team are now much happier and much more productive. I'm thinking about applying for the now vacant role as his boss. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge is Ice Cream, episode 159. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Please poke the like button before you go, it does encourage YouTube to share the video around. Okay. Let's see. Well, an exciting thing I woke up to today, uh, before we go to the question of the day. Uh, I've had a trouble with the, the plumbing in my house for a while. It's the pipes outside the drains, uh, which causes um, shenanigans with the toilet sometimes. Uh, for a while, I was having to call them every few weeks, but it settled down for a bit, and it was like maybe once a year I'd have to call them. 
and it happened again today, sure enough, just after I'd woke up, so I really wasn't in the mood to deal with it. Uh, and now I'm currently after having a plumber come out, an emergency plumber, who couldn't cause and solve the issue. Uh, I'm now waiting on something coming with a machine to stick it down the drains outside to, to fix it. Basically, those pipes are damaged. They need to do something to fix them properly. Um, who knows if they ever will. It'd be a lot of disruption, but it would, you know, would ultimately fix the problem long term. <sighs> anyway, that's enough grumbling for me, and we'll move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... Is there any type of business that's no longer around that you miss? Like, for example, would you go to a, a rental shop, like a video DVD rental shop, if they still existed to get your movies? Personally, I am so glad we don't have to do that anymore. Uh, I think they were great for the time, it served a purpose, but we have a better system now. You don't have to ever worry about late fees. You don't have to worry about them when you rent a movie uh, online. You don't have to worry about them not having enough of the thing. The only concern you really have there is uh, make sure your internet's uh, connected. Uh, but a lot of them let you download it for offline viewing as well. So there was also that. Uh, plus, it's a lot. It's actually a lot cheaper just to buy things these days than it was. I mean, if it's an older film, you can generally find it um, a, a copy, to, a physical copy to own that they'll mail to you for as much as it would cost to rent it in many cases. But let me know what you think. Uh, it doesn't just have to be obviously uh, like uh, video rental places. It could be any other kind of business you think of that is no longer around. Let me know what you think in a comment below. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.